Hi guys, it's Dylan from Bijou Diamond Jewelry in London with another watch video. And today we're taking a look at the Patek Philippe Nautilus in steel with the blue dial. A specific reference we're looking at is the 5711. So the 5711 uh, steel with the blue dial that we're looking at today is possibly one of the most important watches and most talked about watches in the watch industry at the moment. Uh, it sells for insane prices over its list price. It also has a huge fl price fluctuations as well. And the summer, last summer or, or kind of autumn, we saw big, big price booms on these watches. Uh, the Nautilus is obviously a very important watch in, in the industry. Um, there's lots to talk about with this watch. So as always, let's go back in time and look at the history of the Nautilus and the 5711 and learn about how this watch came into the watch industry. Uh, so we're gonna go back to the late 1960s, specifically 1969, which is when Seiko released a quartz watch. Uh, the, this watch really transformed the industry. It was the first quartz movement that we'd ever seen in the Swiss watch industry. And it was obviously offering a much lower price point than a mechanical movement. It also was much more reliable, much more accurate than a, a Swiss watch. Um, so there was only really advantages to a quartz movement over a mechanical movement. And it was in the time of space travel where people were looking at things of the future, computers, etc. So uh, this really was seen as the future of watchmaking. And as a result of this, many of the big Swiss watch houses like Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, um, not so much Rolex, but many of the big brands really suffered massively uh, as a result of the introduction of a quartz movement. So each of the brands really knew that they had to create something spectacular in order to bring back the interest to Swiss watches that were made by hand, mechanical movements, you know, a real beating heart rather than just a battery. Um, so they knew they had to create something pretty special to, pe to remind people why you'd spend that extra amount that the, the, the Swiss watches, the mechanical movements cost. And so Audemars Piguet was actually the first uh, brand to release a watch that would bring people back to look at Swiss watches again. Uh, and that's one of the most important watches ever created, which was the Royal Oak. Uh, Gerald Genta, who was a watch designer in 1971, was approached by Audemars Piguet to create a watch that was just unseen before, you know, a totally brand new watch that you definitely couldn't get if you were looking at a quartz movement, you know, a quartz watch. Um, they went the opposite end of the spectrum and they didn't create something that was going to undercut themselves or, or be cheaper and compete with the price of the quartz movement. They did quite the opposite. In fact, they made one of the most expensive watches ever that was kind of 10 times the, the price of the equivalent sports watch at that time. So, and for that reason, it wasn't particularly popular at the beginning, but we'll come on to that. So in 1971, Gerald Genta was approached by Audemars Piguet. He designed the Royal Oak. Um, and presented to Audemars Piguet, they loved it. And in 1972, they released the watch. Uh, it wasn't so popular at first, but the reason being is because of that insanely high price point. Um, the reason why it cost that much though was because even though it was crafted in steel, um, the finishing that Audemars Piguet put on the watch was so complex and so high end that it was even more uh, beautiful and even more intricate than a dress watch. Um, the, the thing that made it also extra expensive was the fact that to do that in steel was incredibly difficult. It was okay to do it in white gold or platinum that's a slightly softer metal, a slightly easier to machine, but steel is incredibly hard. And to create brushed and polished fin finishes and, and create these by hand and also be able to um, alter the shapes of the watch uh, is and machine a case is very, very difficult in steel. So uh, the first actual prototype was made in white gold. Um, that's what they displayed when they first released the watch. Very high price point, the first thousand watches sold pretty slowly. After that though, it gained massively in popularity and Audemars Piguet um, was you know, back in the game again. You know, people realized why Swiss watches were uh, beautiful and, and people appreciated the Royal Oak, the fact that it really was an incredible watch that could be really your only watch. Uh, it was appropriate for all occasions. Even though it was a sports watch, it was still incredibly beautiful and stunning and special looking as well. Um, so a few years later, Patek thought we've got to compete with this and Gerald Genta went to Patek Philippe, uh, release or revealed his sketch or his design to them for a new up and coming watch inspired by the Royal Oak in a way. Um, and that was shown to Patek in 1974, which was the Nautilus. He showed them the exact design pretty much that we see today, uh, with the kind of ears and the, the porthole look. Um, 
And a few, year, well, a couple of years later on in 1976, Patek Philippe released the Nautilus. But prior to that, they were slightly uneasy about this design. They weren't really sure. Uh, reason being is because all of Patek's watches at that time were dress watches in precious metal. Uh, so steel sports watches was such a foreign thing to the brand and such an off-brand uh, you know, piece to be created. So they were kind of afraid that it wouldn't be received too well and their fans and you know their, their collectors would not really respond to this watch in the way they imagined. Uh, so there was big hesitation over whether or not they should release the Nautilus. Uh, but they eventually decided to release the Nautilus in 1976. Uh, again, the watch didn't do so well at first. This was reference 3700. Um, the watch didn't do so popular partly because it was actually even more expensive than the Royal Oak, which was already an incredibly expensive watch. So, But later on, the watch was accepted and, and people really responded to the Nautilus and understood, again, the same way they did with the, with the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, the fact that this watch was a truly special piece. Um, skipping on a few years now, we saw many different variations of this watch between this time, uh, between 1976 and 2006. Uh, some precious metal variations, some complications, um, but in 2006, um, to celebrate their 30th anniversary of the Nautilus, the 5711 reference, which is what we're looking at today. Uh, the 5711 versus the previous reference, uh, you know, the predecessor, was slightly updated. It featured a slightly more rounded case, uh, a slightly larger case as well, uh, and just some refinements to the watch overall. Um, the watch also now featured a in-house Patek Philippe movement as opposed to the Jaeger movement that they originally featured on this watch. And from that day in 2006 when that watch was released, uh, there's been waiting lists and the 5711 has been incredibly difficult to get, I'd say within the last four years, maybe a little bit more than that, the 5711 has been almost impossible to get at list price from a boutique. Uh, most boutiques will be lucky, even major boutiques like the London Bond Street uh, stores, uh, will be lucky if they get maybe one of those per year uh, to allocate to their clients. Very, very high demand and incredibly low supply. And Patek is looking all the time at dropping that supply lower and lower and lower. Uh, I know Philippe Stern is not very uh, a, a big fan of the Nautilus line. Um, there's lots of interviews out there about him talking about what he predicts for Nautilus in the future. And um, it's pretty clear that they don't want to focus on Nautilus much at all. Uh, they really want to focus on the dress watches, which is really the DNA of Patek. So that concludes the history of the 5711. Let's take, or the Nautilus in general, let's take a look at the actual features of this watch. Uh, so we're going to start, as always, with the clasp. Uh, the clasp on this watch is a nice clasp. It's very low profile, which I really, really like. It's very comfortable as well. Um, it's not as good as some other brands out there, like Audemars Piguet. I think the Audemars Piguet clasps are better. Uh, it feels slightly more flimsy compared to the Audemars Piguet class. Uh, it also has no twin trigger. It's kind of like a, a resistance um, clasp, so you have to pull it to in order to open it up, which I really don't like. I also don't love the fold over section of this clasp. I feel like it's a little bit of an afterthought. It doesn't really in keep with the beautiful, exceptional finishing that this watch has. Um, so the clasp is not my favorite, uh, but it is comfortable and it works. Obviously no adjustability. Uh, it's not as secure as something like a twin trigger clasp from Audemars Piguet. Neither is easy to, to get off and put on as those watches as well. I always find these a little bit dodgy and, and kind of, not dangerous, but you have to be very careful when you're taking this watch off because you have to pull it quite hard in order to, uh, to take it off. Um, moving on now to our bracelet, we've got our iconic Nautilus bracelet with the bubbles. This has remained pretty much identical to the original design that was released or designed in 19, um, 1974 by Gerald Genta. The watch features kind of, or the bracelet features these sort of bubble links, which is the iconic Nautilus look. Uh, I personally am not a fan of those bubbles. Uh, they're also a bit of a scratch magnet as they protrude slightly out from the bracelet and they are of course in polished finish. So when you scratch them or you know you scuff them, they are very easy to see when it's in polished. Um, the bracelet is nice though, it's very comfortable. I love the fact it tapers up and seamlessly interacts with the case. Uh, there's The finishing on the, on the bracelet is stunning as well. Uh, again, it's not quite as special as some other bracelets in the industry, uh, not to mention some brands, um, but it is a nice bracelet, just not my favorite one. Uh, I find the bubbles slightly cumbersome and not so elegant. 
Um, moving now on to our case. The case on this watch is beautiful. Very, very slim case like the extra thin. It fits really nicely on the wrist as a result of that thin case. It kind of hugs your wrist really nicely. Um, the accents on the case, or, or sorry, on the bracelet are carried over to the case like our bubble links. Um, we've also got some nice little polished um, bevel edges on the side of the bracelet that continues onto the case. The case is really beautifully balanced between polished and uh, satin finish as well, or brushed finish. Uh, same way that the Royal Oak from Audemars Piguet is. Um, I think that's what's so special about uh, Gergenta's designs is that not necessarily all about a super high mirror polish finish on this watch. It's about the finer details and the accents and the bold, sharp edges that these watches have that makes them so special. Um, not necessarily that they're super shiny. Uh, this watch just features a really, really beautiful balance of polished and, and brushed finishes. Um, I love the ears on this watch as well, the, the either side of the crown or opposite side of the crown and the crown side. It helps to balance that watch out much more nicely. Um, I love the, the design of the bezel, the kind of half octagonal, oval, rounded, square bezel. Uh, the case back on this watch is a clear crystal case back like the Royal Oak. Um, we can see straight through to the movement on this watch, which is a stunning Patek Philippe um, movement with a Patek, Patek Philippe seal which means it's finished to an exceptional level. All the screws are polished by hand. Every screw hole is polished and beveled. Uh, it's just finished to an unbelievable level. Uh, there's probably not really many other brands that can match to Patek Philippe in terms of their finishing, unless you're looking at maybe an independent watchmaker. Uh, they are really the top of the top in terms of movement and case finishing. Um, moving now onto our dial. Our dial on this watch is the stunning iconic blue dial for the 5711. It features a very, very similar tone of blue to the original uh, reference 3700 that was released in 1976. Um, it's kind of like a darker gray blue. The early versions of the 5711 were much more of a blue uh, tone. These later ones, so this is a slightly later model that we're looking at today. Uh, it features a much more of a gray blue color. I wish this watch was slightly more blue, but I definitely appreciate the fact that it, this one is slightly more true to the original uh, 3700 reference. The dial is very balanced as well. We've got simple hands, uh, three hand design seconds, uh, minutes and hours with our date window. Uh, yeah, super elegant, very symmetrical um, apart from the date. And we've got a nice pattern on the dial, like a wave pattern, which is really, really nice as well. Very simple, clean, elegant design, super legible as well. The white dial is unbelievably legible. Okay, so that concludes our features of the 5711 uh, on to whether or not I would own this watch. I think I would possibly own this watch. I think I would own another watch over this one, which I'm sure you can guess. And that is coming on to a future video, which I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks to compare this with one of its biggest competitors. Um, I love the 5711. I love the, how thin it is. I love the way it really hugs the wrist. I think it's a beautiful watch. It really does suit my wrist and suits a massive range of wrists. And that is a great thing about this piece. Uh, if you're looking for a real classic, then the Nautilus you can't really go wrong with. Uh, I think the thing that puts me off slightly about the Nautilus and the 5711 is the bezel design reminds me a little bit of a TV, which is not my favorite look really, if I'm being honest. Uh, this is me being super honest now, uh, but I definitely can appreciate all the, the finer details in this watch and the exceptional finishing to the movement and actually the case as well. Um, and Patek Philippe is my favorite brand, so it's hard for me to, to be critical about a watch, um, but for me, Patek Philippe really is about the dress watches, not necessarily the Nautiluses. Uh, but let us know in the comments, what do you think of the 5711? Do you like the 5711 in this blue dial, or the white dial? Do you like the Nautilus in general? Uh, what do you prefer, this or, or maybe a Royal Oak, or perhaps a, another watch from another brand? Um, let us know in the comments. And also let us know what other watches you want us to review. We've got many more watch reviews coming soon, um, so stay tuned. And as always, if you're interested in this watch or any other watch in the Swiss watch industry, then don't hesitate to contact us. Our details are in the description. And also at the end of the video, it'd be a pleasure to call this watch into stock for you.